So welcome everyone. My name is Josefa Domingos. I'm a physiotherapist and John is a speech language pathologist. We are usually in Portugal, but we do travel a lot. So John is not. Um, so hopefully we'll try to do this talk. And what's interesting about this as we were sharing in, there was a lot of, um, of feedback and input from the questionnaires, which we really appreciate so that we can add in information that is um, relevant to the group that is here. So, and we were fascinated to see, in fact, it's a topic that I don't think we often talk about it. People might feel uh, less comfortable to discuss this with their neurologists, for example, or with their teams. But in, we hope that at the end of this conversation, we can all um, safely understand why it's so relevant. And on that note, this actually um, comes to me in a moment that I had um, a person with Parkinson that I treat for a couple of years. So here's Luis, and he he's 68. He has Parkinson for more than 10 years, and he comes in and he says, you know what? I went to five different doctors and I asked about constipation. And I got five different medications. He says to the same five doctors, I asked about urinal problems and they all told me to go to the urinal doctor, urologist, right? And so he says, so which makes me think either we know too little about this or too much, right? So either people know too much about this or the doctors or there is really not consensus. So hopefully what we want to achieve with this presentation is to think about why does managing our constipation be is relevant for Parkinson? Because when we understand the why, it's easier to probably adhere to the strategies as well that exist. So at the bare minimum, we hope to be able to organize the information that exists currently regarding this topic for you. And so we hope it will be useful for you. So when we get into the topic of constipation, maybe we can get into an actual definition. And this is coming from a set of guidelines that, that were released. And generally speaking, uh, when you have fewer than three bowel movements per week for at least 25% of the time over the course of three months, so one week a month, uh, with an onset that's at least six months long. So, you know, everyone has a minor episode that happens up to one thing, but as we'll find when we go through the survey, it's much more common to have this as an ongoing issue that needs to be managed. And then some of the other components that could be part of this include having strain when you're trying to have a bowel movement, having a stool that is very hard or lumpy or difficult to pass, Sometimes you may feel that you went to the restroom, but you still haven't emptied your bowels completely. And then if there's something that may be blocking it or, or um, uh, making it so it can't pass through, there can be other components to that. And sometimes, you know, in extreme situations, you might actually have to digitally uh, manipulate the, the, the stools in order to make them work. You have to use your hands. And so those are coming from the formal definition, but from looking at this in a clinical perspective, at least uh, one week per month of less than three times a week. That's where we would start with. Okay, so let's dive into our first question, which is why does this matter? And we thought about a couple of reasons why. I always tend to, in anything, in any symptom that we're treating in the clinic, is like if all most of the treatments that we have is based on changing behaviors, convincing people to do things. And so we can only convince truly someone if they really understand the why. And I think the first one is really the frequency that this happens, which reflects also the numbers of responses that we had. We do know that, you know, according to the different research, that it is a very prevalent topic. I almost admire that we don't talk more about it, right? Uh, we have, according to the study, it can be between 60 to 80 percent of people with Parkinson have constipation. It is identified as a symptom that may precede the diagnosis itself by maybe 20 to 40 years. And it also, um, we know that it might tend to increase as the disease progresses. So this is like basic information about how, it, how relevant it is in the context of Parkinson's disease. 
when we think about, okay, according to the group that we have here today, yes, it, it, it also aligns with this knowledge because we had at least 44 people or 50 people that are here or that um, answered other questionnaires referred that they had experienced constipation as part of their Parkinson. So the frequency is obviously we, we, we focus on things that are annoying us most and those that are frequent annoy us most. The second reason is very obvious, which is the impact it may have on our daily life. And when we think about this, different meanings can come from this. This means when we, we study um, people with constipation and without constipation, we have identified that there's differences in certain areas. One of them is we identified that it is most common to happen in people with Parkinson that have more of a rigid uh, phenotype, which is uh, usually they might be different subtypes of Parkinson, uh, how we characterize it in science. And we might have someone that has more predominant tremor, for example, or more predominant rigidity. And in this case, constipation is associated to someone that has more rigidity. It has also been, when there's a comparison, we tend to see that people with constipation tend to take more Parkinson medication. And they also prone to have, I'm sorry, the, it's incorrect there, prone to have more anxiety and also depression as well. There's just a mistake here in my slides. And obviously the last one is the impact it has on quality of life that I think no one can argue. One of the key questions that when we are uh, with, I would say with neurologists, this would be a key question that people would ask to identify if, if the person has problems with constipation. You know that when people participate in research studies, usually you get a full assessment of everything. So you go through all the non-motor uh, problems and this would be the question that pops up. Um, but it should be part of the routine assessment anyway. So over the past week, have you had constipation troubles that cause difficulty moving your bowels would be a quick question just to identify if the person has. So zero would be normal, right? The person not having any complaint. But what we saw from, from the question is it was mainly, even though there was not a big distinction between slight and moderate, but most of the group refers that they have constipation that causes them to have some trouble doing things. So that means it stops you from doing something or from being comfortable. So reflecting on identifying how it impacts quality of life, there were several answers and I'm going to highlight just a couple of them. So we can all probably uh, see the impact it will have on traveling. If we are dealing with a problem, I used to have someone that I treated that he would tell me that, uh, Joseph, it's like me, I live in, in um, dependent on the toilet because it's like the two, three days that I'm able to go, I'm good. And then after I'm living again, the drama of I have to go to the toilet. Uh, so it was interesting. I was like his whole life was managed according to that. So traveling and being out of your routine can make it more challenging. Then we had someone that referred that gas can sometimes result in small emissions. So we can in only imagine how that impacts social life. Another challenge was about trying to drink more water. And I'm sure you hear often from all the health professionals and friends and everyone is always telling us to drink more water. And now if you add, oh, you've got constipation, drink even more water. Other things that people find is challenging is you will see here different strategies that people use and just putting them all together will be um, almost like a dedication just to this topic. When we put this all into a scenario of, of Parkinson's disease where we have lots of symptoms and then if for each one we have to manage in very specific ways, I can only imagine how overloading and burden that can be. So taking enough fiber, eating enough fruit, and in line with what I was saying, it's really about how can we do this consistently. So we have a whole set of tools that we can use to reduce this problem. But the truth is, if putting it all together consistently can be quite a challenge. Someone mentioned that the biggest challenge was really finding something that works to relieve this constipation. And 
Another interesting advice was that um, someone felt there was a lot of inconsistencies. And as we were doing this presentation and trying to um, see different perspectives of this topic, I can validate that there is a lot of contradictions, a lot of people saying different things. Um, and so having one practical advice, we hope that um, that we are that we have been able to gather those advices here. So we, we made an effort to collect all the strategies that people are using for constipation. But let me show you more, more things that people that, that we can, um, as I go through them, let me think about like, so timing, you cannot uh, fool around on your way to the commode. So that means uh, once you get the urge, it is actually recommended if you're able to go immediately when you feel uh, the urge to go that uh, because once that urge is passed, then it will be much more difficult to induce it. So and that sometimes can be difficult given the difficulties to get to the toilet. Another challenge was keeping track of when the person had bowel movements. So in a world currently where everyone tells you to track every single symptom, uh, choosing which symptoms are more relevant can be on its own a great challenge. What I usually recommend is just choose your you know, top three problems and focus on being able to really assess those as, as a, a means to guide people not to be overloaded in what they're measuring. We had someone that actually referred, I have severe back pain and the only relief I get is to sit down which is not good for my constipation. So here we recognize that there probably is a role for exercise, that for movement, because the bowel movements are more are slower, they are compromised, and so obviously there's a role for movement. And if the person has more back pain, that makes it even more challenging. Okay, and then other things that were uh, shared with us was people that were worried about interfering with activities that they might, so programming activities, I often have people that ask me for specific times of the sessions because they are worried about um, having to go to the toilet in the morning. They have those routines. Or someone being at work, as this person says, I'm afraid of needing to use the bathroom at work or while others, um, while with others. I'm often unable to eat, uh, so dinner with others is awkward. And this gives us a sensation that it will also impact the way we feel in terms of appetite. And our last impact here, just uh, someone that shared, we selected the ones that really have key messages. I'm feeling like I had to go and then not being able to go. So the frustration of trying to and, and not being able to and feeling tied to the bathroom, as I mentioned also before. Effects on sleep and also the impact it might have on urinal uh, situation. If we have a constipation, then our bladder will also be compressed, so there will be also an influence. And then finally, obviously, this um, difficulty of trying to find a balance between taking too much um, medication, having the opposite effect, and balancing this will be also was considered one of the main challenges. So I'm sure because you deal with it, you know how this impacts us. Now here I think is the most one of the most important uh, notes of why it is important for us to have these talks and why it's important for us to stop and to think about this, which is the way that constipation will interfere with the medical, uh, with the observation of your medication. And I hope that you guys are aware of this already because it's such an important issue. And I'll give you a practical example. I had someone come into the clinic and someone that didn't have a history of falling and then suddenly the wife is very worried and she's saying but the constant falling and constipation is now a problem so this was a new thing they had just come from the weekend i hadn't seen them for a week and he says this weekend we could barely move him today he is better to which i was like is there anything that would justify the sudden change because if there's no changes in medication you know in sleep habits or something and, and then she did use the constant falling and constipation seems to be a problem. So we grab onto this word and I ask her, tell me more about this constipation. And to my surprise, she says it's been nine days without going to the toilet. He just went yesterday, so he was starting to feel better. Uh, so sometimes we might not be aware that this could have such an impact that the someone that wasn't falling 
suddenly he starts having falls because simply the medication is not being absorbed. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. So we can always consider this in the equation of when new problems come in. And, and so keep in mind, this is a key sentence. Constipation may contribute to delaying the observation of your medication or even in total failure of it not working. And this will have an impact on how your symptoms, the mind ones that are affecting you with Parkinson, might um, be impacted. There's two complications that have been recognized in the literature that are, we are trying to avoid when we think about uh, helping people manage better this topic. And one is obviously the intestinal blockage or occlusion. And again, recognized as um, we really want to be able to have an optimal clinical response with the levodopa. It was interesting to see this recognized in a research study. And there's one more reason that I found very intriguing to share with you, which is the impact it has on pain. Now, living with pain can be, I'd say, one of the most challenging symptoms because it's very difficult to focus on anything else when people are in pain. But here we're not talking only about the impact of pain in stomach pain. I'm not talking about stomach pain. Here, what we know is that people that have constipation have higher level of pain, so the perception of pain is greater. And this has been researched, and what the research has showed us is that there is an increased pain severity and interference in people with Parkinson that have constipation. Specific pains were identified, namely pain that's related to fluctuation of the medication. Again, it links to what we said before, if your medication is not making effect, then those pains that people usually might get when the medication is not working, or when you have those periods in on off so on is when you feel that your medication is having an effect and off is usually the end of the dosage where people might not feel that effect that it's working so well and the goal of the doctor is always to be able to for you not to feel those periods of on and off so the medication is timely given in intervals so that you would not perceive it but the truth is, so this constipation will affect this type of pain and also pain at night. Very interesting information that comes, which made me think, okay, so every time I'm thinking about managing pain and musculoskeletal, imagine back pain. Someone can in and they have back pain. There's nothing that, that I relate to more to Parkinson than anything else. And now I will be more aware of asking the person, is your constipation how's how's your gastrointestinal how's how many times do you go to the toilet per week right so it's just being sensitive to these things and how it will influence that and if imagine this works imagine something so simple as us helping the person improve their constipation would alleviate the pain how wonderful it is for us to have solutions i want to highlight as well that besides this uh, have a motor pain or that I'm, I'm giving the example of back pain but not only what we also identified is that there is a, a relationship between uh, non-motor issues so people with constipation will show that they have more difficulty in all these this list enormous list that you see here of sleep of having more uh, cognitive memory uh, urinal uh, sexual it, all non-motor issues just become worse there's probably lots of reasons for this, but I think the most obvious one is the medication is really not having also that effect will contribute to this. Okay, so hopefully with that, I have convinced you that the why is very important for us to manage. And so now when we make a list of things that probably will help you, you won't like, okay, you know, this is just too much. I'm not even going to look at it. You know, Annette, that's very really interesting about the pain and the non-motor symptoms because, uh, uh, we know pain is pretty common in Parkinson's. It's one of those things where 30 years ago, they're like, it's not related. And now we know, of course, it is. But it wouldn't be interesting if you could provide some relief to the pain just by addressing just addressing the constipation and then all the other factors, anything musculoskeletal or time for the medications. So um, I'm going to move into how, how we might address this. What are some common uh, uh, treatment symptoms? I want to say very carefully at the beginning, it's important to talk with your doctor to come up with a treatment plan. So we're giving you our best advice, but uh, everything's going to have to be filtered through 
hopefully your movement disorders a neurologist, but if not, then your neurologist or primary care physician. Um, and um, you bring me up here, Josepha. I'm going to start by talking through the guidelines from the International Parkinson and Movement Disorders Society, which we call the MDS. And when they look at uh, the, the treatments that have efficacy and evidence to support them, at the top of the list are a couple of kind of pharmacological approaches. Um, this macro goal uh, is polyethylene glycol. So in the US, I think we call it Miralax, and there's a lot of different names for variations of it. And um, then the lubristone, lubriprostone is another one that's actually a pharmacology approach. Those are the ones that have um, strongest effort. And then there's some other versions and variations that, that might be possible. Your doctor may give you an option. So again, when you look at those, they're considered what we call likely efficacious and possibly useful. And I won't get too deep into the um, into the the semantics of the way that the society provides its, its statements on what works and doesn't work. But that's pretty that's pretty good evidence. Um, um, be the likely efficacious being even stronger. Um, there's not a lot of things that are completely like this is definitely working. I think likely efficacious is a very good recommendation. Um, again, um, <laughs> these are things that you wouldn't take without talking to your doctor, even though Miralax is available over the counter. And then um, that's become something where people do get worried that they're taking too many laxatives or could they be overstressing their symptoms. And I have to put uh, the caveat that certainly if you take too much of a laxative, you can have electrolyte imbalances, you know, some of the, the sodium and, uh, and other potassium and other electrolytes in your blood could be depleted. It could lead to some cardiac issues and, and other damage, um, but that's usually more with a stimulant laxative. So something like Miralax is actually, um, it's an osmotic laxative. It's pulling liquid from other parts of your body and bringing it to the stool. Some of the other ones work by stimulating the system, and that might be a little bit more, more aggressive. And this is why your doctor is going to have to help you decide. Many people I know that are kind of on a routine of uh, one and then adding the more stimulant version in as needed. That's okay. But it's one of these things where you could overuse them, but usually it's not the Miralax. It's usually something more, more stimulating, stronger. Now, we would like to highlight this because I was mentioning at the outset that ANOVA, uh, Sonia has been really uh, great about seeing the topics that are important and kind of highlighting them and getting them into the into the website. And so this is a program that they did a while back or a web page that they put together a while back on constipation. And this comes from your own doctor. If you were at the program that we did back in July where we talked about sources of information, I think it's really great to get information from your own doctor at first because they'll, it'll be aligned, it'll be accurate. And so talking from Dr. Reedy's notes here, um, starting with a bulk laxative, uh, like a psyllium husk powder that's like a Metamucil or something like that. Um, then they add the osmotic laxative, which is the Miralax we talked about. And um, again, the fact that they're talking about it on the website with recommendations, tells you how fairly um, fairly benign it is. I won't say it's completely benign, but fairly benign. And then adding the stimulant laxative. And um, the one thing I'll say with the, the you know, whether it's uh, Metamucil or Citrucel or Fibercon or whatever um, kind of bulking laxative that you're taking, that's the powder, make sure that you're including enough liquid with that. Often if you're taking that, you're gonna wanna add more liquid to make it work. And sometimes maybe what I would add on top of that would be other sources of fiber that have a liquid in them already. And, uh, and uh, someone put in the comments here about, you know, Miralax and fresh fruit. And it's like fresh fruit's a great source. Um, this is on the website there. And I think we've put it on there before, but we'll just add it to the ipmdc.org and the slash constipation if you need to look it up. Now, another thing that you gotta be careful of is medications that can be exacerbating the constipation. And um, there are a lot of them out there. In the Parkinson's arena, in the realm of medications that you take specifically for your Parkinson's, 
it's not as much of an issue except for a certain class of drugs called anticholinergics. And so the most common anticholinergic that you see in Parkinson's in the U.S. is trihexaphenidol or artane, but there are other ones that your doctor could give you. Usually it's for people who are younger in the earlier stages and it's addressing the tremor primarily. You know, sometimes you have people taking beta blockers for that same reason. And they slow down your system a little bit, and that's why um, they may exacerbate constipation. Uh, another one, uh, another class of medications that are very famous for causing or exacerbating constipation are narcotic painkillers. So things that have uh, not just the over-the-counter stuff, but things that, that actually have hydrocodone or something like that in there. Again, because their method of action is to slow your system down, just like a benzodiazepine so slows your system down, that means that uh, it's going to possibly make your system a little slower as well. And then calcium can be a, a real, uh, it's, a, it's a mixed bag because uh, the calcium, <coughs> excuse me, calcium in acids like Tums provide immediate relief and they're fairly benign, but that calcium will bind and, and actually perhaps uh, make, make the constipation worse. And even the metal-based versions, the, the ones that are using the molunum like Mylanta, that can also cause that same kind of binding. Iron supplements can cause that as well. And so you got to be a little bit cautious with that. Um, there's a little bit of um, a little bit of evidence that perhaps a dopamine agonist also might have some influence there, but that's getting pretty far into doctor stuff. And if your doctor has you on that and you're having constipation, you can have a con conversation about the constipation without making a decision about what's the best drug because you're still kind of you're kind of walking a tightrope. I will say too that um, with uh, an acids, reflux is quite common in Parkinson's, and so you'll want to address it. But again, if you can get to a way of addressing it that includes a diet that is not promoting acid production and using reflux precautions, I think that's better than just taking the antacids as needed as a as a case by case basis. Um, there's one other thing I was going to say that this is not the case though for if you're on a proton pump inhibitor, so like uh, pentaprazole or amaprazole, the, the pills that you would take, Nexium, uh, what are the ones, Prilosec, all those ones. If you're on that for your your your, your reflux, that's not an issue for for constipation. Okay, yeah, good. Thank you. I'm going to move with you here. Um, probiotics are really interesting um, because. They're pretty benign, and um, there have been a number of studies. I've seen um, some some attempts to do studies on a very special formulation of a probiotic. I've seen studies on multiple strains versus single strain, and they have very conflicting results. Some would say single strain of a particular uh, microorganism gives you the best results. Someone says that multiple strains do. It, it, it's not well um, uh, identified as a clear winner, but what we found is that probiotics can do can provide some real benefits for both uh, uh, how how often you you have a bowel movement and the quality of that bowel movement, the quality of the stool, and they're fairly easy to uh, to get to. And let me just give you a definition of a probiotic versus a prebiotic. A probiotic actually contains live active um, uh, uh, organisms and uh, they they interact with the flora and fauna in your in your stomach and um, they improve that and that's what result, results in the benefits. Prebiotics are actually uh, food materials usually they're pretty high in fiber and the flora and fauna use them as fuel as food and then turns that into the the bacterium that's the healthy bacterium. And we, someone was mentioning in the um, the, someone was mentioning in the, in the uh, comments about an article they read recently where they're talking about the gut-brain uh, hypothesis, and there has been a long history of, it's still a hypothesis, it's still Brock's hypothesis uh, that the Parkinson's may start in the gut and then travel through the vagus nerve into the brain and then lead to the propagation there. Po possible, it's quite, quite possible, there's a lot of support for that. But uh, the problem is we don't quite know exactly what it is yet. We don't know exactly where it lies. Is the problem that we see the changes in the makeup in the gut different because of the Parkinson's or is it what causes the Parkinson's? We don't know the answer for that. 
I will say though, when it comes to probiotics, that we found that mostly over-the-counter formulations seem to be highly efficacious and you don't have to go buy some special formula. And actually, if someone's selling a special formula, I'd run it by the doctor because it doesn't sound medically sound. There's no benefits of something special versus something you can buy off the shelf. Um, just going through this, this is a, uh, just a, a review of this. And they found that, again, they found improvements in not only the constipation symptoms, but also some benefits in the UPDRS, which is a big fancy, it's when your doctor does the stuff with the fingers, it's the movement related, and they showed some benefits there. Um, and again, um, in, in spontaneous bowel movements in, you know, uh, quality of the bowel, but also the fine improvement in movement kind of ties back to what Josepha was saying, where if you're your stomach is not digesting and it's not getting through your digestive system and into your colon and then going through your body, it may influence how well your medications work. And if you can improve your constipation, you might find your medications working more efficiently. This is one that Josepha uh, uh, mentioned that she actually got and trained many years ago when she was a student of nursing <laughs> um, before she became yeah, so, a physiotherapist. So what we try to do is uh, between uh, John, my my experience, and also Nancy that you will see in a minute, um, just giving you different perspectives of of how people usually share with us how they manage it as well. And this was one strategy which is uh, doing an abdominal massage, and um, it's interesting to see that I actually made it to the list of the MDS. So it is it has been researched, even though it might not have sufficient um, evidence to it. I am going to play a short video, but it's not uh, the relevance. Take me out. Food is... uh, but I will let you know that you can you can you can find these uh, these videos on YouTube. If you obviously the reference, we will share here the link of this one. If you if you like, it's a physiotherapist that's just showing the movements that people can do. It's fairly harmless, so it's um it's it's meant to do soft movements following the the intestine as it would um, project in terms of movement. And it's just um, something additional that people can do maybe when they wake up in the morning and then after doing this massage for imagine three, five minutes and uh, soft movements, then maybe add in a warm, warm of um, a warm cup of water and maybe that might help. So um, that's a recommendation that exists and it's just uh, something to trigger the muscle contraction and also the relaxation, especially if we if the person's feeling really bloated and discomfort. Um, it has been shown to to help. So it's it's a suggestion. Uh, we're not literally showing you how to do it, but please, we'll have the the, the video so that you can go through it as well. Yeah, I, one thing I like about that, besides the fact that you can do it yourself and you can do it in the morning when you wake up or whenever, <laughs> is that that video is with a, a physiotherapist, and I think I think she has a good handle on it. Although she's not a Parkinson specialist, so good 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 find. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, again, I, I've already alluded to this a little bit, but I, I think the most important thing you can do uh, for constipation is try to give yourself a diet that is going to promote uh, not only good flora and fauna in the stomach, but also um, promote the amount of fiber and, more importantly, the amount of fluid, the amount of liquid to make that happen. And so um, uh, one thing that we've talked about before is the Mediterranean diet, beg my pardon here. And um, the Mediterranean diet, you know, a lot of fish, uh, not much red meat, very few sweets, lower fats, and the fats that you get are coming from olive oil and other sources that are not associated with animals. And um, this was a small study at the Fixel Institute, that's the uh, University of Florida, that's Dr. Um, Dr. Michael Oaken, so the medical director of the Parkinson Foundation, they always have great research. And what they found was a simple five-week diet of, of um, Mediterranean diet improved uh, uh, the scores of both, again, um, what they call the gastro gastrointestinal symptom reporting survey. So the, the different scores in there related to how frequent, how, how much strain, how much effort, that kind of problem like that. And it's one of these things where um, you know, actually, they did. A, they just published another study, an MDPI uh, longer study, where they showed that both this approach, the Mediterranean diet approach, or their traditional approach with Miralax and other kind of approaches, uh, interventions, 
were both pretty similar in their final results, but uh, that also meant that you know, with this, you're getting the actual benefit of the diet, of the Mediterranean diet, the cognitive benefit, the non-motor symptoms benefit, the extra fiber, and, and they were actually tracking inflammation in that second study. So it's something to consider if you're if you haven't gotten into that approach, it might provide additional benefits. It has benefits for cognition for sure. It has benefits for some non-motor symptoms, and now it has another benefit for another non-motor symptom, which is uh, constipation. And um, again, looking at ways to, to do to do increase your fiber, the metamucil or fibercon, the psyllium husk, and that that's great. And um, if your doctor advises that, that's a first line. Again, make sure you're adding enough additional water because that's pretty heavy stuff. Until you need to make sure you're giving it the the water to make it work. But another easy way to do that is to have naturally high fiber foods in your in your. Uh, diet, and so that can be fruits, that can be vegetables, um, berries. It could be it could be any number of things. Um, someone mentioned uh, you know uh, difficulties with a salad, and I would say that sometimes salads can be difficult. But um, uh, almost any of the fruits listed here are not only just high fiber foods, but some of them, especially in the onion family, there stuff like that are actually uh, prebiotics. Uh, prunes are something that are under under mentioned, but I think they are also very good. And now they think they've rebranded them to dried plums, which I don't really care one one or the other. But they're they're available quite frequently, and something everyone should add into their diet. Uh, foods that have dairy are problematic for Parkinson's for a couple of reasons. On, on the one hand, there are uh, many individuals that are dealing with a relationship between protein and their levodopa, their, their Parkinson's meds. And so that, that can cause their medications to not work efficiently or maybe not provide the amount of benefit. So that's something completely separate. Um, there are also some indications that, um, that they may um, uh, exacerbate certain symptoms. But uh, the real factor here is the calcium again. We talked about the calcium in Tums. Uh, the calcium within dairy products can actually bind and increase uh, constipation. And I think many people are familiar that cheese is a, a, the big source of constipation for sure. It could also make your, your microbiome, your body, have some dysbiosis, as they say, meaning you, you could throw out the flora and fauna out of whack. This is something that we got again from the constipation website on the ipmdc.org website and uh, someone started doing it. And just a couple canned pumpkin at breakfast, a couple tablespoons. I think this is interesting because um, it's super easy to do. I mean, it's, it, it's any of the squash family, but the fact that you can just open a can up and put a couple scoops in every time you're making oatmeal or if you can just eat it. I think that's great. I saw another recipe on there for a muffin that had a lot of uh, fiber as well as some prunes in there. I think that's a great idea. You ought to check out their website. I particularly like this one because it's just so simple, right? Yeah. In the list of so many things people have to do, the more simple it is, the more probable people will do it, right? Well, and, and as someone who happens to like pumpkin pie quite a bit, I would probably turn mine into pumpkin pie flavor, but it's actually, yeah, it's great. It is very simple. Um, this is anecdotal. We were we were talking with some folks at a conference a while back, and uh, someone in their dietitian recommended um, not just fiber, but fiber that has liquid, and they recommended celery and asparagus, just adding it to the diet. And they said it anecdotally again, they've had quite good results with that, and that makes sense. And and celery is kind of a blank canvas, so you could have celery and then have a little bit of, of a dip with it or, or you can flavor it pretty easily. You gotta be a little cautious if you're doing peanut butter for the protein interaction. But just again, the, the takeaway is not what you're doing specifically with celery, but that you're picking foods that have a fair amount of, of liquid in them, like watermelon would be a very good example. That has a fair amount of liquid in it along with the fiber. That's always gonna trump uh, an additive or a supplement. And again, uh, we know that uh, people with Parkinson's often don't have enough to drink, and some of that has to do with not wanting to get up and down to go to the restroom. But um, it, it's a, not having enough uh, water makes your medications work more poorly, 
It has uh, an impact on your constipation. And um, it's something where everyone should be trying to get more of it into their system however they can. Now, again, they have the recommendation of the eight glasses a day. Okay, that's great. Um, but some of that liquid will come from the food. So it's not like you got to be pounding these gigantic glasses all day long. All, but you should be adding more into your diet for sure. One thing I'll say, I mean, we, we think caffeine's great. Actually, coffee will actually stimulate bowel production. You know, so it, it can be a great uh, tool. But throughout the day, water by itself or with some fruit flavor in it is fine. But caffeine is not great because it actually as it's a diuretic. So if you take in an eight ounces of caffeine, you're going to uh, stimulate more than eight ounces of uh, urination later on. So you're going to have a net loss. So definitely don't cut the coffee in the morning if it's part of your routine. But uh, don't don't overdo it throughout the day. And then obviously caffeine has its problems with sleep as well. So even another reason to, to stick with water later on in the day. So like Coca-Cola or something like that, that would be negative. Yes, unfortunately, uh, I, I do like Coca-Cola, I'm, I'm sad to say, but it would not be my first recommendation, especially later in the afternoon because the half-life of caffeine means it's in your system for quite a while. Okay. Um, and this is a recommendation I like to make a lot of times because smaller meals throughout the day are good for a lot of reasons. They're good for reflux. They're good for energy levels if you're someone who gets sleepy after you have a big meal, especially a big heavy meal. So smaller snacks throughout the day also help with your constipation because your body doesn't have to work on processing this big meal. It can take a little bit of time. And again, if you if you can focus on a couple snacks at some time throughout the day too, you can have a snack that's got just a bunch of fiber and drink a healthy bit of water with it and know that you're you're doing your part every day to kind of keep the system going. It's it's when you let things get uh, out of hand and you have to do something heroic that becomes problematic. So just make it into your system. Like like the two tablespoons of, of pumpkin puree is a really good example of that. Um, for people that have difficulty with chewing and swallowing, um, it's it's definitely a problem that's associated with Parkinson's, and it's why you would work with a speech therapist. So uh, if you have that issue specifically, and you haven't worked with an SLP, you might ask your doctor for a referral because they probably some stuff they can do to help. But on top of that, in addition to that, or if you've done that and you haven't gotten everything you needed from it. Um, instead of trying to find, you know, raw vegetables, you know, uh, uh, raw carrot sticks and, and raw uh, broccoli and whatever, you can lightly steam it and make it a lot softer. And it's it has actually a dual benefit because those kind of foods are actually pretty good for reflux. So they're a great snack to have around in the fridge. And it's kind of a finger food as long as you're not. Uh, it'd be a finger food in private, let's go that way. It's pretty easy to pick a couple carrot sticks and just eat them real quick. And so you might lately steam them, or you might find other things that are not quite as heavy that still provide that fiber. So berries versus apples, as far as chewing ability. That's the way I'd be looking at that. Okay, and of course, exercise has to be present in in. Uh in everything we talk about Parkinson, so I'm not going to go into detail. It was interesting. I was uh, trying to see um, what if there was anything specific regarding exercise, and the, what we saw is just comparing again with people without constipation. We realized that people with constipation tend to do less exercise. Okay, not surprising if movement is more challenging, but there was actually a reference regarding. Uh, what type of exercise would be more relevant for constipation and aerobic exercise um, came out uh, with more notice and specifically a reference to walking. Now, if people are uh, unable to do periods of walking, obviously, I think it's about moving the limbs and how that affects the abdominal muscles as well. So even if we're in sitting position and we are, you know, bringing our legs up as if we are walking, we will also be providing that pressure to the muscles, that movement to the muscles. Uh, so that's something to think about if we could have specific exercises. For now, the only reference we have is regarding aerobic exercise could be different things, uh, but the walking is an example. So that's anything that uh, raises your heart rate and the, the blood flow in your body. 
I mean, just like everything else, medication, timing, sleep, everything, uh, having a routine for, for uh, your bathroom habits is very helpful. I mentioned before the coffee. Sometimes people will have a nice breakfast and they'll use the coffee as a way to kind of uh, get them going in the morning. Well, that also is a good time to stimulate your bowels. And so it's good to consider that. Um, Josepha mentioned this before. Um, it, it's so not I see John. What? I, I saw you frozen, so I was going to jump in. That's teamwork. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, you, 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 I'm, I'm saying what you said before, so you have it. It's when you have to use uh, the bathroom, when you have to have a bowel movement, don't, don't try to hold that in. Do it. That, that, that you're mistraining your body. You're making it more difficult. And be aware that if you're traveling, particularly if you're flying where you're up high and you get quite dehydrated when you're up in the sky, recognize those impacts and maybe increase your your um your intake that day your fluid intake and then you can i think that the key message will be like if you uh, have maybe slightly sometimes you have this problem but now you're traveling and so you might want to consider maybe having a, a, a rescue strategy so in case it does happen you have something with you that you can help manage the problem so that it doesn't become a problem so that's that's the focus on traveling. It's, um, and then we can also think about, uh, is there things that I can do um, while I take a bowel movement that would actually be relevant or not, right? Again, looking from different perspectives of professionals. Uh, for who doesn't know, Nancy Hilmer is an occupational therapist and she kindly, did this, she was unable to be here today, but she kindly did this video. So let me know if the sound comes out because she has some tips that she wants to share with you. Uh, so there are different ways that I have adapted this toilet in the past. You can put rails on it to give you armrests, which is fine. And the whole idea that we're talking about with constipation is that sometimes the toilets are too high when you put a riser in them you're up like this which is not going to be helpful for constipation you want to be as low as you can uh, kind of like um, in parts of asia they will just have a hole in the ground and you actually squat down and um, that actually is the best position for women having babies and also for trying to uh, have a bowel movement, but we don't have that here and we tend to raise our toilets up to make it easy and so we're kind of working against ourselves there. So if you have a lower to toilet, you can put the armrests on, I just don't have them on right now, and that will help. Or if you have a wall in front, that's ideal. You want, this one's just a little bit high, but you want it about shoulder height as you're reaching for it, so it's just slightly high. Um, and if, if you were standing up, you want it about elbow height. So again, it's just a little bit high for me, but that's all right. It's good enough. So, so what you can do is, is use that to bring you forward. And, and you can just relax in this position, or you can kind of do a repetitious reaching. And, and that way, you're kind of trying to stimulate that gut um, with all the movement and the squishing and you can even put your your fist in there and try that it's sort of a nursing strategy that we used to do in the hospital of pushing and and kneading around in the gut to try to get things going um, but certainly you can also just try to relax try to you know um, you don't want to strain you don't want to sit on the toilet and just strain 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 um, that's going to make it more likely that you can develop hemorrhoids. Um, you can also just reach to the floor if you don't have a bar in front of you. But certainly having a bar in front of you just as a functional thing is super nice because not only does it give you a, a target to reach for as opposed to a bar that's back here and it's, it, it gives you no leverage at all. Your, your motion needs to go low and forward. Um, but it also helps when you are standing to be able to pull up pants and have something here. If you don't have a bar or maybe it's a, a mobile home where you can't put a bar in, you can actually put your head against the wall. I would not have a picture there. Um, but you can put your head against the wall and, and actually have a little bit of leverage um, for extra balance to 
mouthful of it's like you've got a tripod going there instead of trying to do it like this and then kind of losing your balance. So anyway, those are just a few strategies for bars. Okay. So she was talking about the benefits of, of the, that squatting position when you're using the bathroom and there's actually a, a product out there. there's actually now a bunch of knockoffs but um, this product is called the Squatty Potty which is kind of a funny name and they have really hilarious commercials which we won't show you here but there are a couple of um, yeah someone just brought it up here there's a couple of uh, variations out there there are knockoffs that you can get at different you know Amazon whatever and what I might say is you could probably experiment just by putting you know I don't know some books or something to give you that elevation or some blocks and if it feels good you might upgrade to an actual squatty potty or one of their competitors just so that you have something that's easy to move and clean and and it's more sanitary but um, again, the science behind it, I first heard about a squatty potty when we had a pelvic floor specialist and occupational therapist working for us back like 10 years ago in Colorado. And I think it's a really, it's an interesting revelation and it's not, it's not a pill or a supplement. So I think I like it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to comment something which uh, uh, I usually tend to analyze how people are doing it before I suggest any changes. And it was, this is based on some experiences that I had in a household that I recall now, uh, where the gentleman had severe um, rigidity. So he was uh, in, in later stages in, in Parkinson with the, uh, struggling a lot. And I recall the wife uh, complaining a lot. It's because he's pushing himself backwards and he should be pushing himself forward. Um, and what we realize is that because of the, all the posture changes and your muscles are working in a different way, so the way people might activate um, their muscles might might occur compensations. So the way you might feel that you need to be in order to get the bowel movement going might be very specific to the person. So also consider that. Sometimes we might see these things and they're very uh, focused on maybe... It would be nice if we had a research study with this used in Parkinson for me to be a little bit more safe about recommending it. But just keep in mind that sometimes... Um, the way you, f you, f you are able to feel that you are pushing better and more comfortable might, might be worth thinking about, okay? Uh, so one, we are naming about 10 things that people can do uh, to help with constipation. And this is obviously one of them. It's exactly what we are doing now, which is, you know, keeping updated on uh, things that are coming out. As you could see, we, we, we included some research. So you see things are being studied regarding this topic, which is uh, interesting. And new knowledge is always coming out. So never lose hope that there will somehow be more uh, organized uh, treatments for us. So even though we might feel that this is just what, what commonly is said. Um, and then another one would be highlighting the role of different professionals because this might be a topic that maybe might uh, be mentioned in a neurologist uh, consultation because it's just impacting life so much and so people might refer it or maybe in nursing. It's more commonly with the nurse that people discuss this. But the truth is um, I think that every professional will be that is treating people with Parkinson will exchange, uh, we, we spend a lot of time with people, with, with patients that I treat, like two, three times a week. And so we get into all sorts of conversations, and this one does come up. And, and so I think your health professionals might, each one of them will have a different look and, and tips and tricks regarding it. So this is just a couple of them that keep that also as a tool, which is just ask and see if somebody has some new tricks that might help. We were curious to ask in the questionnaires if people uh, usually communicated regarding this topic, um, that maybe there's a more stigma around it. And it was interesting to see that nine people never discussed that. Maybe, um, and then, but you know, most people like rarely, sometimes it will come up. Again, there might be some sort of embarrassment regarding this, but um, I think more and more people are very open to sharing knowledge. And so it shouldn't be an issue. Another one that we want, uh, so another uh, tip is regarding, okay, so if I do have this problem, what would be relevant for me to track it? Is it just enough for me to get to the neurologist and say, you know what, I'm, I've been having a lot of constipation. The emphasis we give 
on a complaint will influence how much the health provider will uh, respond. Um, so if I'm saying, yes, I have constipation because I haven't gone to the toilet in nine days, you see that's an alert. Like I know I'm supposed to go three times per week, but I'm only able to go once in 10 days. You can see how the this saying the sentence and giving this inference will be completely approached differently from the, the clinician. It shouldn't be this way, but we know that knowledge is power, right? So when we use the right words, we influence the right results. Um, so just here, trying to understand if people, if this was actually something new, if it was something that made sense or not. And we were actually surprised that almost like uh, 32 people said yes, they usually uh, track it. So it's it's probably having some impact. So you, you might want to remember, okay, at least uh, this week, maybe per week, I'll, I'll try to remember which, how many times I went. We want to leave you with a guide on if you are dealing with this problem and you want to just have a little bit more uh, systematic um, registration or notes, maybe to discuss with the doctor what, what would be relevant to, um, to maybe think about. Again, we know that people are, are having not only constipation, there's a lot of things going on. So we will respect how much we ask. Each professional has to be careful about how much they ask people to do at home. But in case this will be useful to you, we just want to share that it is important to, if you are dealing it as a new problem. So my first thing is like, okay, you go to the neurologist and you say, I have a new problem. So there's a focus on the, it just happened. The frequency that it happens as, you, as we discussed. And then also thinking about how severe this is impacting your daily life. Now, there are ways for us to know how severe it is. It is quantified in uh, scales when we assess this problem. It will be here on your slides. I'm not going to go through it, but it's all about how much discomfort it's, it's placing on you. You can always come back to the slides. And then another one will be also focusing on the impact of medications. So making this notice, like I feel my medication are not working so well. It um, would be a relevant thing to, to tell the doctor because of my constipation or in the days that I'm more constipated, I feel that I'm slower, for example, or I have more rigidity, or I have more tremor, stuff like that. A key word, which is strain, also thinking about, okay, um, how much, if, if I'm uh, experiencing a lot of difficulty passing the stool, if, uh, you know, finding it painful to be able to, to do the bowel movement. And again, I'm just sharing here that there, there, if you really want to be more perfectionist, you can use this information. <laughs> but of course, just identifying to the doctor, I feel pain when I'm, when I'm trying to, to do a bowel movement, I think would be relevant. So you can see how, how much it's, it's impacting. And then we can think about, let me see, uh, so abdominal pain as well would be relevant. Again, leaving you just the focus about usually symptoms always like what is the frequency that it's happening so we see if it's really relevant or not and then the severity is about the impact that it has on daily life it's always the two main ways that we assess symptoms in parkinson we have other things that might be relevant when we have constipation which is uh, regarding uh, maybe if you're having the opposite so it's just uh, sometimes as we mentioned before some medication or something, it might be having the opposite effect and the person is just dealing with, with more. And this can also be measured. You can also think about, is this constipation affecting also uh, how my weight? So understanding if you're losing your appetite, if it's influencing the how you're eating. And then I always like to also um, help people think about things that make it worse and things that make it better. I think it's two key ways for people to deal with any symptom with Parkinson because it helps you have a sense of control. When you identify things that make it better, you can you can use that as a rescue strategy, right? Um, and things that make it worse, you can try to prevent them. So it's it's one way to intervene with, with symptoms. And I think it works well for anyone, any symptom. And then obviously the there's a role for, for help and if you need to to, I would say, to organize all this information and all the help. Maybe we can have, uh, you know, the, uh, what, what, the journey partners, as I prefer to call, 
organize all those things in the morning and so it's just there and you arrive for your breakfast and everything's already done that's perfect world right <laughs> now that's very helpful right if everything's just organized <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so we come to the end of our, our talk and probably we can go through the chat and just see what um, what has what questions have been placed, if there's something that we need to cover. I, I've been going through as we go along. There was one interesting question a little bit about is um, about COVID and constipation. And all, all I'll say is that COVID is still quite a bit of a black box for us. But there has been some some uh, interesting presentations, uh, usually at a Congress or something like that, where just any kind of viral uh, infection can lead to a worsening of the symptoms just because it's slowing your system down in general. Hopefully it's transitory and not lasting, but you know we find that with COVID that you do have long COVID. So yeah, it's a possibility. One interesting program I saw in Madrid a couple of years ago by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Schneider, was the impact of possibly getting COVID long term over time and whether that might increase a risk of Parkinson's and the answer is they're not quite sure there, there has been some um, interesting correlations Roger Barker did this out of UK a decade ago talking about uh, flu shots and vaccines and um, not taking them and getting more flu and having a higher risk of Parkinson's long term so I think there's something there but generally speaking, COVID's going to move your system down. It wouldn't be unlike going in for surgery or something. It's going to move your whole system down, and it might throw you for a loop for a couple of days, so you'll want to be extra careful. And then you'll want to monitor to make sure that it's not a long-term issue, like, like long COVID. Really interesting question, though. I think everything else I've been typing away, I see Sonia found the recipe I couldn't find before. I think we're all in there. Okay, uh, someone asked me the implications of alcohol, beer, wine, and in moderation. Uh, uh, you talk with your doctor. Some doctors are, you know, one drink. Uh, some doctors are no drinks. Um, the reality is that alcohol is a depressant. It's going to slow your system down. But I, as far as its direct con uh, influence on constipation, I'm not quite as certain. But I think it's something to talk about your doctor. And then, yes. And then um, someone has said exactly the concern about Metamucil. Pharmacists said it might actually... Um, because you take your Parkinson's medications many times through the day, it might affect absorption. And I think that's a possibility. I think my, what I see often is that it's not administered with enough liquid and it doesn't have as impactful benefits as, say, a high fiber diet with fruits and vegetables, which is what we should be doing, which we should all be doing, Parkinson's or not. Good, good stuff. And, if anyone and, wants to unmute and ask us a question or we're right here we'll be wrapping up then we really hope the information was um at least useful to organize it <laughs> yeah. so yeah and we'll have all these available uh the slides including some of the additional slides that that lay out the, the process of tracking the the, the constipation as well as the video are going to be available on the ipmdc dot org website.